Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from everyone attending all over the world. I have the pleasure of moderating today's webinar, which is one of a series of webinars that discusses the impacts of COVID-19 on the Arab region. My name is Noor Ghadanfar. I am an urban planner currently in Houston, Texas. I'm a 2019 Master of City Planning graduate from the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT. And I'm also an MIT uh, Arab Alumni Association member. And the, associ the association was really established to create a connection between MIT and the Arab world and to establish a space for alumni, for faculty, for students to collaborate. Now, before I begin, I do believe it's important to acknowledge what's happening around us. All three speakers and myself are currently based in the United States, where we've been seeing the reverberations of the Black Lives Matter movement. I want to acknowledge the importance of this movement, not only for the US context, but also globally and specifically for the Arab world. The message of the movement transcends physical boundaries and speaks volumes, and I do believe it's important to listen. Um, the Arab Alumni Association will be hosting a talk on inequality and social justice in the Arab world next week. So make sure you're following us on social media to get the details for that. Today's webinar, however, will delve into the complexities of collaboration and entrepreneurship during COVID-19. And we have a brilliant lineup of speakers to help us discuss this topic. So thank you all for joining. First, I would love to introduce Dr. Jinan Abunadi, who is the executive director of the MIT Sandbox Innovation Fund program. She brings a unique combination of experiences from academic research to senior operational strategic roles in startup companies and large businesses. After completing her graduate work, she worked as a research scientist at BBN and as a postdoctoral lecturer at MIT and advised undergraduate and graduate students. She held leadership roles in two of the most successful local Boston area startups, ITA Software and Kayak, where she gained deep knowledge about the travel technology sector. Most recently, she ran a global portfolio of third-party products for Travelport, giving her opportunity to establish partnerships with companies across the globe and to advise and evaluate a number of startups in the travel sector. Dr. Abunadi earned her PhD in electro electrical engineering and computer science at MIT, a bachelor's of science in electrical engineering from Caltech and a bachelor of arts from Bryn Mawr College. Our second speaker, we have Marcus al -Atcha. He's a researcher in the city science group at the MIT Media Lab. He's an architect and urban planner interested in the intersection between data-driven urban analysis tools and policy strategy for rapidly expanding or urbanizing cities. Marcus joined the City Science Group to work on research and deployments associated with the CityScope platform. And prior to joining the MIT Media Lab, Marcus worked for eight years at the Boston-based architecture and urban design firm Machado and Silvetti Associates, where he worked on projects that included the Rockefeller Cultural Center in New York and the American University in Beirut. Most recently, he served for nine years as the executive director of a public-private development corporation responsible for two urban expansion sites, east and west of Cairo. His current work and research is focused on new approaches to urban management and collaboration strategies for developing and emerging countries. And in addition to a Bachelor of Architecture, Marcus has two master's degrees from MIT uh, in city planning and in architectural history, theory, and criticism. Our final speaker, is Dina Sharif, the executive director of the MIT Legatum Center for Development and Entrepreneurship. Dina has over 20 years of international experience in integrated sustainable development, corporate sustainability management, social entrepreneurship, youth unemployment, and women's economic inclusion, among many other things. Dina holds a master's of public administration and management from the Harvard Kennedy School, an MA in economic development studies from the American University in Cairo, and a BA in political science and international relations, also from the American University in Cairo. Committed to building sustainable, inclusive, and diverse societies through the application of a more conscious form of capitalism, she co-founded Ahead of the Curve in 2012 to further that goal. And Ahead of the Curve is currently the leading social enterprise in the MENA region to support impact-driven entrepreneurship in addition to creating a movement of impact investing. 
Dina was also the founding director of the American University in Cairo Center for Entrepreneurship, where she also holds, where she also held the Willard Brown Chair for International Business based out of AUC School of Business. She is currently a senior lecturer at MIT Stone School of Management and a partner in Disruptech, Egypt's first fintech focused venture capital fund. And so it's safe to say that our speakers today hold a long list of accomplishments and I'm really excited to dive into uh, our discussion. So the first question, and I'll hand it over to Marcus, who I believe has a presentation for us, are what have been some of the ways MIT has adapted to COVID-19 and while still managing to create an environment of collaboration and entrepreneurship? Over to you, Marcus. You're on mute, Mark. Yeah, there. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Let me just share my screen here. Give me one second. Uh, it worked a minute. Can you see my screen? Yes, I think um, it's a little blurry. So Hello? if you want to, there, that's perfect. Okay. So I'll just give a brief overview of the work and research we're doing at the City Science Group, which is a, a re research group dedicated to all around the world, uh, Northern and Southern Hemisphere, which gives us kind of a large breadth of, uh, of research topics to, uh, to follow up on. We have three lines of research in our group. One is looking at lightweight mobility systems, point-to-point -point mobility systems that can also be used for last mile distribution. And really it's about how, how you know, as cities become denser and, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, more, with more people, how are we going to uh, move people around without congesting uh, streets? This is a quick video showing what one of the interactions looks like where you call this vehicle like an Uber, it comes to you uh, autonomously, you pedal it and charge it as you're moving through the city, and uh, then uh, it goes off to its next uh, 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 patron. We're also looking at how to uh, you know, live large and small spaces as cities become denser and real estate prices go up. How can we start giving people more uh, options or more, uh, uh, you know, more, cert more amenities within smaller spaces? This group uh, is actually working with the likes of Google and Ori on developing deployable uh, prototypes uh, for in, in Boston and other cities around the, around the, uh, the country. Uh, we're also looking at ways of using the large, leveraging large amounts of data being collected in cities to help inform policymakers, decision makers on what urban interventions, how urban interventions are gonna impact the urban ecosystem. Um, and I'm just going to bring up one of our collaborate, a few of our collaborations. This is the Volpe site behind uh, Kendall Square, or, you know, in Kendall Square, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, MIT recently purchased this parcel for $1.2 billion, and we're looking at how to develop interactions uh, between the various stakeholders, Matimco, the private arm of MIT's real estate holdings. Um, the Nonprofit Educational Institute uh, uh, and the City of Cambridge. And we do this by kind of mapping large amounts of data to various uh, sites within the, within, 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 the, uh, within the parcel and then developing kind of interaction tools that allow users to uh, create more analytical decisions around uh, some of the challenges they're looking at and understand what the urban performance impact will be. Um, and we've done this in other places like Riyadh, where we're working with uh, um, the city of Riyadh on the development of an innovation district around an existing university. This project is over, but it kind of shows how through very simple use of color, one can start understanding what the impact of locating housing vis-a-vis -vis offices, vis-a-vis -vis educational uh, uh, facilities could have on uh, urban performance. And we're doing a lot of these simulations of, you know, like looking at kind of how land use or mixed use land use groupings can impact things like mobility as well as the spread of diseases uh, in urban environments and how that can also be translated to office space uh, and simulations looking at kind of how 
high risk, medium risk, low risk uh, 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 infection scenarios can be understood through uh, manipulating schedules or our paths of migration through uh, migration patterns of people through office space and what that will look like. And then finally, I'll just talk about what I'm working on, which is developing a, um, a, uh, a, a, a project in Egypt where we've got you know, cities like Cairo that are growing at three or 4% a year. Cairo is one of the fastest growing cities in the world. And we're starting a collaboration with Cairo University um, and the Ministry of Communication on setting up kind of a uh, city science lab at Cairo University to look at challenges uh, around uh, mobility, land use, and uh, um, and now hopefully uh, the spread of diseases. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcus. Um, Janan, I would love to I hear would... what. Yeah, no, that was great. I would love to hear what the Sandbox Fund is doing um, and how it adapted to COVID nineteen. Janan, you're on mute. <laughs> There we go. Um, Nora, I just want to thank you for uh, putting this program together. And I'm so glad to um, uh, recognize actually some names and faces from my student days among the alums that are joining today. Um, I have great memories of being part of the Arab Student Association and it's wonderful uh, to um, participate in an Arab alumni uh, uh, webinar. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'd like to actually maybe take uh, some of our arms back to thinking about their days at MIT. And I will talk about how COVID-19 kind of hit us uh, in a, almost a dramatic way, uh, just because of the timing uh, and everything that we had going on at the time. Uh, the Sandbox Innovation Fund program is one uh, that uh, is focused on student entrepreneurship and uh, on the innovations coming out from uh, directly from the work that the students do. Uh, and in that it's kind of unique within MIT um, uh, and uh, works along a lot, a lot of other programs, but our focus is primarily on providing students with funding and resources so they can go from idea to impact. Uh, and we work collaboratively with Legatum and we have a lot of students from the Media Lab and some of the ideas that Marcus has talked about, you, we see very much in, uh, uh, in the program. But going back to uh, when the crisis started, we had our biggest event on March 5th and March 6th. And March 5th happens to be the day when MIT actually put the travel ban on, put the ban on gatherings and all mm -hmm. of that. And so on March 5th, we had our biggest showcase event where we have about 150 people attending and about 50 companies showcasing their work. And in the midst of that event, the, the faculty director of Sandbox is the vice chan chancellor. And in the midst of the event where we had everybody coming in from all over, including people flying in from Singapore, um, uh, the vice chancellor kind of says, the email is coming out saying basically that, you know, as of tomorrow, all gatherings are off and all travel is off. And it also so happens to be uh, the next day was our funding board event uh, and right after our funding board where we decide on funding uh, startup companies, I was about to fly to Morocco to launch a sister event, a sister program at UM6P. Uh, so we had just set up a partnership um, whose goal uh, was to uh, uh, take Sandbox and bring the same type of resources and launch them for students at UM6P, which is a university in Morocco that's uh, funded by OCP. And that evening on March 5th, the vice chancellor in Waits tells me, okay, you're not going, you're not traveling. So we've got this partnership all, you know, ready to go, ready to launch and everything, all hell broke loose really that evening. And um, uh, luckily our events for so the funding board events we were able to go on with them the next day, which was a Friday. And in the midst talking about, you know, kind of adapting, pivoting, we're just thinking, okay, how can we in the usual MIT way is no matter what's going on around us, you know, we've got, you know, uh, a pandemic, you've got a lot of unrest, but we have to keep going. That's the MIT way, we just can't stop. So all along 
all of this, I think all we're thinking, all of us is how do we keep going? How do we make sure nothing stops? How do we keep supporting our students? So from there, really what happened is the following week, all hell broke loose. You know, all students were asked to leave campus. We were asked to leave campus. And in the process, we were all working over time, as you all know, to figure out how do we do this so that nobody stops their work. And that was kind of our biggest concern is how do we keep going so that absolutely nothing stops. So people keep doing the work that they need to do. And we can talk a little bit more about that. Uh, given all of the constraints, no access to lab uh, and so on and so on for the people that need to build. And maybe later on in the discussion, we can talk about how some of the challenges that came about the crisis or actually became opportunities and how in the usual MIT way, we kind of channeled kind of all our energy to figure out how to make the challenges into opportunities. We managed to launch our partner uh, program thanks to one of our mentors, um, Marwan Hassoun, miraculously kind of in the midst of the pandemic, we managed to get about, you know, a uh, hundred new projects funded in Morocco. We managed to actually fund about $600,000 of funding that we gave out to students, uh, funding about 350 ideas in the midst of a pandemic. And uh, some of those ideas, some of those students actually focused much more on um, uh, problems that were very directly connected to COVID-19 problems. Others actually kind of stepped back and stopped rethinking and uh, reevaluating their assumptions uh, thinking about this, this disruption, what's the world going to look like? And uh, we can talk about a little bit uh, later how startups are actually best positioned to uh, be able to bring about solutions in a disruptive time uh, compared to other uh, well-established and existing companies. So I just wanted to share a little bit kind of some of the drama around what happened with the pandemic, uh, given that you know there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of pain and a lot of hurt, but really kind of within MIT, this resilience to keep going and to not stop and just keep working um, is just um, uh, really amazing and uh, we're happy to talk about some more details later on. Yeah, that's incredible to hear. Uh, Dina, I wonder if you could follow up with that on how Legatum is currently operating, right? I'm sure in the beginning everybody was taken aback, but how have you moved forward? At yeah. the well, and first of all, thank you, Noor, for organizing this and for inviting me. I feel uh, I feel very honored considering that I'm the only one who isn't actually an MIT alum, but I am alum from that university down the river. So wow. <laughs> it is uh, quite an honor. <laughs> I think, um, I mean, just following up on what Jinan said, MIT really just doesn't stop. I, it's, it's fascinating. I feel like they didn't skip a beat. In fact, in many cases, People were doing more um, and taking on more. Uh, the I'm a very new executive director, so my role I took on my role in October. Um, I didn't actually relocate to Boston uh, until January, and then this happened. But I have to say that you know the for those who don't know the Legatum Center, the Legatum Center um, was established to support entrepreneurship in emerging markets as a pathway to sustainable development in developing those markets. And one of our flagship programs is a student fellowship program to support students, MIT students who are developing businesses in those emerging markets. And a lot of our fellows um, get support from, from, from Jinan and from Sandbox. And I think uh, it, it, COVID was a really tough transition. And I think students, MIT students demonstrated a huge amount of resilience and patience as everything unfolded. And for the Legatum Center, uh, you know, as a new executive director, there are so many new initiatives that were starting to come into to force and that were being rolled out. And I, and I think um, for us shifting our student fellowship programming in terms of our once, we have a once a week class, we immediately went virtual. I think one of the, the and for all the alum, you, you know this, the beauty of MIT is walking down a hallway and running into an investor or another entrepreneur or, you know, somebody from one of the big tech giants. That, that's the beauty of being on the MIT campus is constantly 
running into all these different people and building up that network of everyone who is doing all these amazing things in entrepreneurship and innovation. I think for, for us at Legatum, what we were most concerned about is how do we give our fellows that same experience virtually? And so we really went out of our way to bring to the fellows um, in the remaining weeks before the semester ended as many people um, as we could into the into the Legatum class and expose our fellows to as many people as we could from our external network um, to kind of replace that whole the, the notion of running into somebody very senior from Google or running into somebody who is an investor or running into a serial entrepreneur. And we brought that to the classroom. And I think that was um, something that was very much appreciated. We had to do our demo day online. How do you do a demo day online and make it successful? Um, so we had to also be very entrepreneurial in that. And we did that. Um, and I think it was uh, I think it was something that we were all very proud of. Um, like what you're doing now, we started doing our own webinars um, as a way to, to initiate thought leadership in what is happening in terms of entrepreneurship and innovation during COVID and what we think will happen in a post-COVID world. We really upped our game when it came to thought leadership and research. So we've really taken the opportunity to uh, put a lot of ideas out there through our blog series. Um, we have a number of interesting working papers that will be coming out of the Legatum Center that are addressing issues that are specifically related to COVID, such as how do we rethink capitalism um, in a post-COVID world? It's clearly not working the way it should. How do we rethink healthcare innovation and what do we want healthcare innovation to look like? Um, and what does that mean? So I think we're, we're using the time to really think about all of the different impacts that COVID will have on varying sectors and on entrepreneurship and innovation, but specifically also what this looks like with an emerging market. So if we're thinking about MENA, um, these are emerging markets and uh, not just emerging, but also in many cases, growth markets where there, there are a number of countries who had been on a, a very significant growth trajectory. And what is, what is COVID going to do in these markets? And um, how do we think about entrepreneurship and innovation now within these markets? And I think these are extremely important discussions. And a few weeks back in collaboration with the Schumann Foundation in Jordan, um, we organized a talk about how to, how to think about innovation driven ecosystems as a way to build economies bottom up uh, in a post COVID world. And I think there was, that was extremely well attended as well. So Legatum Center, not just because I am Egyptian, but we are thinking about MENA as a region of focus um, and, and finding different ways to support the Arab region through, through our work and through our thought leadership. Yeah, I think that's amazing. I did watch the webinar with the Schumann Foundation, Wealth of Knowledge. Um, and I love how you put these like walking down the hallway at MIT because I do believe these serendipitous connections are what make MIT special. And recreating them online, I think is difficult, but not impossible. And, and I think all three of you have shown us the different ways that MIT is adapting. And this is why it's a leading institution in the world. Um, I wanna just take a step back and kind of look at what are some of the biggest barriers or challenges that entrepreneurs have faced in the MENA region specifically before COVID-19, and how have those changed if they have after COVID-19? Um, maybe, Janan, you can take this since you were talking about the partnership with the Moroccan University. Uh, yeah, sure. So I'll talk uh, uh, more about our partnership with the university because I'm not as familiar with the wider MENA region as uh, Dina or Marcus uh, are. Um, but I think, uh, some of the challenges as we were having conversations with UN6P about how do we replicate the same program that we have at uh, MIT and what elements of that program are actually uh, would work and what elements won't work. And so um, in addition to the usual um, uh, parameters such as uh, uh, the ability of having a mature ecosystem with the uh, different types of investors, different type of money and, and so on. I think there are a couple of other really important elements which have to do with the mindset of people. Um, I think what's so unique 
uh, about MIT, uh, about the American system in general, is this uh, idea that uh, uh, if you have an idea, you can actually make things happen as an individual, that you have the ability to make things happen. Uh, even, of course, you're going to rely on a network of uh, mentors, a network of faculty, advisors, a network of uh, potential investors, but ultimately, as an individual, you have the ability to kind of make things happen. And, and I think uh, what's so difficult in the Arab world is kind of creating that belief in people that I, as an individual, have the ability to make things happen and I can figure out how to kind of work through the system and people around me will also believe in me. I think the other thing that's so important about MIT is that we believe in our students. We believe in their ability to make things happen. We believe in their intellect. Um, and and so, so I think the other side of it is making sure that the grown-ups that are surrounding the students believe in their potential. And so, so then in these conversations, is how do you create an environment where you actually believe in the potential of the young people, of the students? And, and so a lot of what we do in Sandbox is we have a very strong mentorship program where the, the grown-ups, the kind of older people, people with kind of experience um, do believe in the ability of the young people to, to uh, achieve. And so we're working really hard also with UN6P to create a mentorship program where um, we are cre creating kind of a collaborative mentorship program where we're using mentors from here, working alongside mentors in, um, in, in Morocco and creating that culture of mentorship uh, as a way to, you know, mentors play a big role, which is they are your cheerleaders in many ways. So they have to believe in you but they also hold you accountable. Uh, so, you know, as, as we say about Sandbox, we're kind of a, a program where we want to lower the barriers. We want everybody to participate, but we also have high standards. So you kind of have to kind of have that balance of making sure you've got people that uh, are cheer cheerleaders, but hold you accountable to actually getting um, uh, work done. So, so I think besides the ecosystem, maturity of the ecosystem, the availability of capital and so on, I'm really interested in working on, on the, 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 the mindset, on the growth of people, both the young people and the grown-ups, uh, so that you kind of believe in the potential of, uh, of the talent, young people that we have. Absolutely. Um, I think that's a really interesting um, aspect, the mentorship, which I, I believe we'd, we, may, we might not have as much of as we do um, in the Global North or at MIT specifically. Dina, uh, I guess I'll, I'll frame the question to you because of you know, your work with entrepreneurship at AUC and your work with Ahead of the Curve. What are some of the barriers that you've seen facing Middle Eastern, North African entrepreneurs before and after COVID? Yeah, um, I don't know. That's a very interesting question. I think you know the barriers are, I think what are a lot of the barriers that exist in, um, in emerging markets in overall, which is like access to capital, access to, um, if you look at in what you need to see an overall vibrant ecosystem, you need to have access to um, good universities, research and development. We don't have uh, something comparable to an MIT in our world, although we have great universities. Um, we don't necessarily have universities that are pr producing this level of science and innovation on a university campus. And I think that's something that is a challenge to innovation in the region. Um, I think there are varying levels of barriers when it comes to access to capital, but I think we've come a long way. And we've, we've seen the birth ecosystems across the region have become, I think, more and more sophisticated. So we do, we've seen an increasing number of venture capital funds emerge. Um, we've seen an increasing number of accelerators, incubators, uh, um, initiatives to support entrepreneurship and innovation coming from civil society. I think there are a lot of private sector initiatives that have taken place. I don't, I don't think that that has, um, we've seen an increase in equally an equal increase in the number of, I would say, innovation-driven entre 
enterprises in the region. I think in terms of seeing the growth of new businesses, we have that. SMEs are um, increasing in number every day, but I think on the innovation side, we continue to fall behind. What does this world look like as a result of COVID? Um, I, I, don't, I don't think that we're going to see a huge drop in, in capital per se. Uh, on the contrary, actually we've seen deals close um, during COVID in a number of countries uh, in the GCC, we've seen deals close in Egypt. We've seen them close uh, in 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 different sectors. Uh, we've seen the the emergence of new funds. You know, Egypt, the one that I actually joined, Disrupt Tech was was launched during COVID. Um, it may have started as an idea pre-COVID, but it was actually launched during COVID. So I think I, I don't think we're going to lose momentum. I think what we're going to see, and what I hope to see, and this is somehow related to what Jinan was saying. I hope to see as a result of all of the gaps that have become very clear in all of our systems as a right result of this pandemic. And when I say gaps in systems, I don't just mean healthcare. I think, I think in terms of education, I think in terms of agriculture, I think in terms of logistics and transportation and e-commerce, the, the gaps have become very clear and the opportunities has, have also become even more clear. And I my hope is that we'll see an, a, a rise in innovators, people who are going to step, youth who will step up and will um, come up with business models to, to take advantage of these opportunities. I, I think the, this realization of human potential is a very interesting one, Jinan. And I've been thinking a lot about human agency uh, during COVID. Just, just because if we, we think about how, um, how the pandemic has been dealt with, a lot of the responsibility has been given to every citizen to take it upon themselves to prevent the, this disease from spreading. And that is about agency. And I think entrepreneurship in large part is about agency. It's about a belief that you can actually make a difference, that you can start a business that can solve a problem and that you can scale it. And I think what we need to see in the, in the Middle East is this embracing of our own agency to create our own change and to do that through entrepreneurship because we need the jobs and we need the wealth generation, but we need to do that in a way that's solving all of our big challenges at the same time. Absolutely. Um, I think that's a great point that you bring up. I do wanna come back and ask Marcus about the research and um, development capabilities and the role of institutions in that, you know, being a representative of the MIT Media Lab, how do you see that playing out in the MENA region? Because it is important. It's almost like an anchor to a lot of the innovation ecosystems and a lot of the entrepreneurship that comes out of that. Almost like, why aren't we seeing more of this? Where are we going wrong? Right. Um, so I'm, I'm very optimistic. I think that uh, having worked uh, in Egypt up until 2017 before returning to MIT uh, to work for Kent Larson, who was a professor of mine 20 years ago. Um, you know, I, I saw, uh, you know, very young people who were very energetic. And if, if the framework is right, are really some of the highest producing people I've ever worked with, you know, really innovative, pumped, charged. And it, to me, it was a really, you know, I was there for the whole party, the whole Arab Spring, to, uh, and 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 I really saw this resilience and strength in people, and I was very very pleasantly surprised. I think our work at the Media Lab, especially in our group, relies on collaborations with people with institutions all over the world, including hopefully Cairo University moving forward. And um, I have been also incredibly pleasantly surprised at the receptiveness or the openness to, um, you know, change the way things are happening. I think that the MENA regions at this kind of, or parts of the MENA region are at this juncture where people are just saying, we've got to start moving differently. We have to change something. And, um, you know, MIT comes with a level of uh, a credibility on you know, uh, uh, certain aspects of this. And, and I found a great receptiveness uh, to that. And I'm 
hopeful that as institutions like MIT move out and expand their, um, their contacts throughout the world, that this idea of, or, or this know-how and knowledge transfer can really spark, you know, uh, trans transformative change in the region. Does that? Yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely amazing. And I love how both you and Dina and Janan as well are so optimistic about the region, of, about the future of the region. Um, it's refreshing to hear, so that's great. Um, I know I see a couple of Q&As rolling in. We will get to that at about um, 110 Eastern time, so in five minutes. Um, so keep them coming and hopefully we'll be able to talk all about them. Um, I did also want to talk about the landscape of startup funding and how it's been affected. Um, obviously, not just with COVID-19, but with the change in oil prices, which is a large number of startups are funded from uh, the Gulf region and they've been heavily affected. How do you see startups being able to acquire funding, especially if you're early or if it's a, if it's a risky idea or risky startup? Jinan? Uh, so I'll talk about the U.S. Uh, kind of uh, early stage uh, funding and what's going on. I think um, a lot of investors, and there's a lot written about uh, kind of how investors are behaving. Um, investors have a lot of cash they have, and, and they'd like to uh, deploy it. And they're nervous, of course. I mean, mm -hmm. the time to be very nervous. Um, the early stage startups have an advantage for investors, I think, from experience from the 2008 crisis in the sense that uh, they are the ones that uh, don't have uh, a lot of um, overhead, both in terms of needing to service existing customers and all their problems and their contracts. Uh, they don't have legacy uh, technology or solutions that they have to kind of uh, keep maintaining. Uh, typically developing new products or cheaper when you're an early stage startup than when you're not. And so I think the, the thinking is that if there's any uh, disruption uh, in terms of either technology or business models, um, as uh, things will be different. I think there's a lot written about how education is going to inherently transform, uh, how um, uh, working is going to inherently transform now that we've discovered kind of a new way of being able to work remotely. Um, real estate may inherently transform transportation, uh, energy usage. So there's, I think, you know, there's a, a clear um, uh, kind of belief that this is going to be disruptive in a major way and that um, startups are the best positioned to uh, bring about disruptive solutions uh, at the lowest cost. Um, so, so early stage investors, I think, are there with the money, um, uh, looking for uh, people with just the right potential, and they will invest in this very early stage startups. That's kind of um, how I see it. And that's kind of the reading I've been seeing around. We have a group of uh, great partners that are very seasoned investors, and that's how they see it as well. Um, and, and so I think uh, if you are an early stage uh, startup today and are able, as we told all of our startups, to take the time to re-examine, really truly re-examine your assumptions about what the market will look like, uh, because that's the markets are going to change, you know, kind of in a, in a big way and be best positioned to develop um, something that's going to work in a new um, economy. Uh, I think, I think you, you, will, you will find investors, you will make the case, uh, and they will be uh, pretty hungry to put some money into these uh, new ideas. That's with respect to the US. Um, I think with respect to uh, the rest of the, uh, to the Arab world in general, I, I, I don't have enough of a knowledge, I think, to tell you what's going on there. Maybe Dina is better positioned to, uh, uh, to talk about that, what I can tell you from our experience with uh, our Morocco uh, partnership is that uh, just I think as both Marcus and Dina said, that the young people on the ground are very hungry, they're very motivated. And already we've seen 
uh, actually, I think something to be proud of, some solutions that have come up that are innovative, both in terms of coming up with, you know, new uh, cost effective ventilators with uh, effective manufacturing for PPEs. I think we've seen some things that will make us proud in terms of how um, uh, people have been able to respond uh, both to the COVID-19 uh, crisis, both from a public policy perspective, but also from um, people on the ground really thinking about uh, technology, science-based solutions. Um, and that's, that's, that's really good to know. So. Yeah, Dina, if you want to go ahead and speak a little bit more about the Middle East. In North um, yeah, I think the, the Arab region, I don't know that it's that different than what I think is happening globally. I think risk capital, that early stage funding, I think we're going to see some, the, the Legatum Center at the start of the pandemic decided to carry out a series of talks with venture capitalists from across the world. And those talks have been extremely, kind, it's been a, private group of open discussions. And it's been a very interesting. And we did write a blog about that on our website if people want to take a look at that. But I think what we're seeing is um, investors are, it's not that they don't have money. I think that they're going to pause and think a little bit about what their next move is, who they should invest in and what sector. Um, I think, I, I'm seeing a number of things. I, I'm seeing investors question their previous behavior. I'm seeing them question the way valuations were done. We saw a lot of really high valuations that weren't necessarily justified across the world, right? So I think that's going to change. I think investors are going to be looking for businesses that are going to be able to grow slowly and uh, sustainably. And those who are consuming enormous amounts of cash um, are going to be questioned a lot more aggressively. And I think these are all positive trends to see in this space. I don't think there will be a lack of capital. I agree with Gina in there. I do think that what we're going to see is capital shifting to different sectors. The kind of overall virtualization um, that we saw happen overnight is going to have huge impact on very particular sectors. I think in the Middle East in particular, we're going to see uh, a lot of shifts within the fintech space. I think we're gonna see a lot of changes within e-commerce. I think we're gonna see, or my hope is that we'll see a lot of changes in education. Um, and I think healthcare is one that will shift globally, but I think the, the region, our region in particular, uh, will, will have its own trends. And the capital is there. And I say this all the time to, to startups who come to me, capital flows where there's a good idea. There's never a dearth of capital. There is oftentimes a dearth of great ideas. And I think that's, that's what investors are really gonna look for. And they wanna see entrepreneurs who are agile. They wanna see entrepreneurs who are realistic. Um, and they wanna see entrepreneurs who are going to start innovating for systemic change because if this has revealed anything to us it has revealed that we really need systems change thinkers um we we don't want to see innovations that are band-aids we want to see innovations that are going to transform systems yeah i, I love that band-aid analogy at the end um marcus there's a question from one of our attendees that i think you would be most apt to answer and it's talking about how freedom of thought and movement usually is an important factor for entrepreneurship and creativity. And would the cyber communication and remote collaboration positively impact entrepreneurship in the Arab world? And, I, and I'm curious also, I guess your experience, especially being in Egypt during the Arab Spring with censorship uh, and how you see what's happening now, is it different? How, has it improved? So I think Egypt's a unique case in that there's much less control on cyber communication than there is in other parts of the Middle East. Um, so in Egypt, I think that the adoption is very high. I mean, it is, it has been very high of things like Zoom and Skype, but in other parts of the Middle East, there has been a lot more control on a lot of these communication uh, technologies. And I, that is, is, is challenging um, working in, you know, Having worked in in, in some of the the, the um, in the Emirates, it's a problem when you cannot Skype or Zoom freely, 
And I think that these kinds of things are going to have to be re rethought and, and how um, I was also speaking with, um, uh, you know, people in, 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 you know, dealing with communications strategies. And now that, you know, now that we are moving from copper cable to more data driven, you know, like, you know, how do you, how do you reassess how you charge people for bits as opposed to time along copper lines? And this is a big, this is something that's being discussed right now, you know, in Egypt very, very heavily because they are trying to migrate communication technologies to more um, um, appropriate systems of, of, uh, of, uh, so, so again, I see a lot of, I, I'm very positive. I see a lot of, 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 of these challenge hurdles uh, being re-looked at and, and, and people saying, well, you know, this is gonna, this is really, you know, something we have to consider differently. Does that answer the question? I hope, uh... No, absolutely. I think, I think that's a great answer. Um, and, and I do, I think it's right. Sometimes we, we might segment the MENA region as one, but it's so different from every country, from every experience, from every government. Um, so I, I completely agree with your analogy there. Um, there is another question from an attendee talking about if you've seen any change in and the entrepreneurs' mindsets before and after COVID-19. So I think entrepreneurs just in general are a special breed and, and they're always thinking outside the box. They're always trying to move. Have you noticed COVID-19 kind of bringing to the forefront more agile behavior or has it complete or has it differed, for example, in the global north versus the global south? Um, what have the three of you seen? You know, I, I kind so of- I, I'd like- Sorry, Marcus, go ahead. Do you want to go first? No, 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 please. Um, I just, there's, I'm just gonna say something very briefly and then Marcus, you can go for it. I think the, the Arab region is, uh, is not an easy place to live. And this is coming from someone who spent the majority of my adult life living in the Middle East. It's, it's often a struggle. And I think um, everyone tends to, and when I talk about the Middle East, I want to kind of leave the GCC aside slightly because, you know, we've those those countries have emerged and have developed very efficient systems for the functioning of how those societies function. But in countries like Egypt and Jordan and Lebanon and Morocco and Tunisia, you have to innovate on a daily basis just to exist. And uh, in places like Libya and Syria and Yemen, where these are Palestine, conflict is the norm. And that creates, the way we exist creates a level of resilience um, and kind of a, a natural ability to come up with solutions and problem solve on the spot that doesn't exist elsewhere. And I, I think, you know, that what that will allow is it means that our entrepreneurs will also be more resilient in terms of their willingness to pivot, their willingness to be agile, and their willingness to deal with really tough circumstances in terms of cash flows and um, thinking creatively about how to manage money and thinking creatively about how to respond to COVID or plan around COVID. I, I think that is very different from what, what we'll see here or what I have been seeing with entrepreneurs in the United States who are really struggling with this kind of really difficult moment because that that day-to-day -day resilience that's built up in you doesn't necessarily exist here and that's a beautiful thing um, and I think on the other side of that is also and I hope we touch on this at some point but I think what is happening with women entrepreneurs um, during COVID is also fascinating. And I think we'll be seeing some really interesting trends come out of women-led businesses uh, during and post-COVID that, that should not go, go unnoticed. I'll pass it on to Marcus now. I wanted to, yeah. I wanted to add to that because I was gonna say very similar, uh, you know, my, in, in my mind, um, you know, uh, so the, the most of the Middle East is in a post-COVID situation yet. So, I mean, Egypt is still expected to hit the, its, you know, kind of peak infection transmission in a few weeks. So they're, they're, that part of the world is still living through kind of um, uh, this, this, this real situation. 
But um, but what I was going to say is that yes, that, that that day to day life is very entrepreneurial on almost every level, and that um, the uh, the resilience I've seen with collaborating partners has been really you know everything from uh, people making their own masks to finding systems to um, uh, uh, leave you know uh, hand washing stations throughout informal communities has been pretty amazing uh, to witness. Um, so I, I think that th this, is, this is an opportunity for the Middle East to really show some pretty innovative solutions that have come out of how people are gonna live together. The other thing that's very interesting is that the Middle East is predominantly urban, right? I mean, people live in cities. So it's, it's urban solutions can really be, uh, 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 I mean, you know, the, the situation of, of public transit, the, the, the condition of public transit, marketplaces, how people are going to start dealing with day-to-day -day life is uh, going to be very informative uh, on what society looks like in two years from now in the, in the Middle East. I think they're going to carry those changes through much more than we will hear. You know, once... Um, so, uh, it'll be interesting to witness, to see, I think the jury's out. We don't, we don't know what post COVID is going to look like yet. Yeah. I, I think it's really interesting that you touch specifically on how the Middle East and North Africa is primarily urban because we are seeing so much come out in North America about people almost being afraid of the density of the urban city, right. And trying to flee from that, but in the Middle East. There's no fleeing, right? So how do you innovate and, and, and live choice. within that reality? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I would absolutely love to quickly touch um, on something Dina said about women-led entrepreneurs, because I think that's really important uh, before we go to our final question from the audience. So Jinan and Dina, um, I would love to hear your experiences with that, um, seeing I think as you're both women entrepreneurs. I'll let, I'll let you go, Dina, first, maybe uh, talk about the Middle East, because that would be... Uh, yeah, quite you know, it, yeah. it's interesting. Thanks, Jenna. It's interesting because, um, you know, I at the very beginning when COVID happened, you there were these constant articles and posts on LinkedIn and posts on social media from all these different people within the entrepreneurship ecosystem giving advice to entrepreneurs on how they can survive COVID. And it was really interesting that a ton of investors were writing. Almost all of them were male and their advice pretty much surrounded conserve your cash, um, keep your teams lean, think about all of your high performing people and get rid of your worst performing people. Um, there is like this, these, this list of things that you needed to do to survive and all of it had to do really with the kind of bottom line. There was very little advice about how to keep your team together, about how to use empathy to rethink about your business model and come up with new products to, um, and I think for me, when I was reading all these things, I kept thinking, you know, women have been doing that <laughs> from the very beginning. You know, that's how we manage our businesses. Uh, being conservative with our cash is has always been a way that women have led businesses because they it's always been so hard for them to raise money. They've always been at a disadvantage in terms of raising investor capital um, and in getting specifically in the Middle East. It's not that easy for a woman to go get a loan from a bank for varying reasons related to uh, in, it regu bank regulations and unconscious bias and so forth and so on. And a lot of the women entrepreneurs that I know were really kind of taking a moment who are not stressing about cash flow, were really kind of taking a moment to think with their teams about how they can strategize long term during this time of COVID. Um, very few of them were panicking about money, very few that I spoke to anyway, very few were panicking about money, very few were panicking about who they needed to um, to, to necessarily get rid of. Um, and it was a very interesting uh, difference from what I was seeing from other, other enterprises that were led by men. And I do think that COVID is going to reveal some uh, 
the, the differences in how few women lead their businesses and grow their businesses. And, I, and my hope is that that's going to be very positive because a lot of investors will really see that they should have been betting on these women from the beginning. Um, so I, I, I do think that we'll see a lot of interesting changes in that space from the investor side, but I also think that um, we're going to see a, an increase in the number of women-led businesses coming out of COVID uh, and, and in the tech space as well. I, I absolutely love that. And I think there are parallels also to how women-led countries have reacted to the COVID-19 crisis. And specifically, I'm referring to New Zealand that has almost like conquered the COVID-19 pandemic uh, inside their borders. And just last week, they've, they've, uh, they're putting an influx of $1.2 million specifically in arts and creative spaces because that's where they see something that's most affected. And I think that's unique and I, and I absolutely agree. I love that. Um, we have one more question, I think, and I would like to ask Janan to see this, uh, to respond to this. So it's asking, it's saying that unemployment figures are soaring due to COVID-19 and a lot of fresh grads are entering the job market. And do you expect a surge in entrepreneurship? Just I, 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 I guess from your role as the director of the Sandbox Innovation Fund, then what are the challenges of some of the employment dynamics you see there? Yeah, so actually that's, that's a very, uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, when the job market doesn't look so good, what, what do these bright students do? And actually what we've seen, just looking, and I've just done a, a, a report for, um, uh, for uh, the vice chancellor, uh, looking at uh, the engagement over the summer. So our requests for the summer for people wanting to do to pursue entrepreneurship uh, uh, ideas over the summer have increased greatly, like hugely. So the number of students who, first of all, uh, there's the job market looking at full-time positions and there are internships. So kind of our students are either looking for a summer internship or are looking for a job. And both in some cases, uh, the job offers or the internship offers were rescinded. So these students now have nothing uh, their summers just opened up and as the summers opened up they're like okay you know sandbox can you support us uh, now I'm going to pursue something that I'm really interested in and I'm willing to you know put all my time in it so we've gotten a huge increase uh, from um, uh, students uh, there so I think definitely uh, the, the students will uh, go look at entrepreneurship kind of their own pursuing their own ideas as, as a way uh, to uh, be productive. Um, and I think the other thing is also the personal motivations. What we've seen is a lot of students are like, you know what, you know, that job uh, where I'm going to do something that's not that interesting, that doesn't seem like it's making a difference in the world where I'm just making money. Now I really want to make a difference. I want to have an impact. Uh, I want to feel that my work is meaningful. So we've seen that also in sandbox and people shifting from necessarily just saying, I want to build a startup, I want to make a lot of money because that sounds really awful today, given everything that's going on to actually, I want to do something good. I want to have an impact. And actually it ties in nicely to what Dina was talking about, which is typically what you see kind of women entrepreneurs, their interest is typically in, in doing something that's for the social good. So that becomes usually that that becomes a preference. So it's very much aligned with the objective of why do you want to do something on your own? What's motivating you? And it's not just making the money for yourself, making money for the investors. It's really to have a, a positive impact and making things easier, making things better, taking away some of the pain points that we're all feeling around us. And that's actually another motivator, I think, for entrepreneurship. Um, not just the lack of uh, jobs out there. Yeah, I think we need an entire other hour to discuss the benefits of social entrepreneurship and like the trend that we see now where so many businesses are moving towards that direction and so many investors are paying attention, right? It's not just a one-way thing, but um, we do have one minute left. Uh, and I know we have some questions left unanswered. What I can try to do is I can send them to our panelists and maybe we can post responses to them on our LinkedIn page so that all your questions are answered. 
I do profusely want to thank Marcus, Janan, and Dina for taking the time to speak with us uh, today. I think it has been a wonderful discussion. Um, I love the optimism that you've portrayed in the region. I love how you've portrayed the resilience of the of everybody in the region, and I think it's absolutely wonderful. Um, so thank you all, and thank you to our participants who've joined us today. Uh, be sure to join the MIT Arab Alumni Association next week on our special webinar discussing inequality and social justice in the Arab world. Um, so Before, thank you. Yes. Is there any chance we can make a final statement? Of course, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I just wanted to say, I think I am very optimistic about the Arab region and I am, um, and I think maybe we all are, but I also think optimism is also a result of privilege. Um, and where we sit and what we're able to see. And I just wanted to also say that there are many, many things to be concerned about when it comes to our region. And um, the future of jobs is on the top of that list. Uh, and over the past decade, I've seen many policymakers kind of put the onus on entrepreneurs and those in the entrepreneurship community to kind of save the day when it comes to youth unemployment. That hasn't happened and I don't see that happening post COVID either. And I think it's just really important to remember that entrepreneurship is important. New business growth is important. Innovation is extremely important, but policy matters. And we really need good policymakers now more than ever. And we need to see multi-sectoral partnerships evolve at a much more rapid rate. We need to see government partnering with the private sector, partnering with civil society. These are things that we have not seen in our region in a very, I would say, in a good way. And I do hope that as a result of COVID, we will start embracing these things more because there will be a job crisis, more so than what we have seen over the past decade. Well said, really well said. Jinan and uh, Marcus, do you have any concluding statements? Uh, yeah, I would like to just add to that, that uh, as much as COVID has brought many challenges, it's also brought so many opportunities you know, the Arab Student Association put together SciTech and brought people from all over collaborating together. I think those collaborations between MIT students and MIT alumni and people in the region and people here, kind of these boundaries have now kind of gone away because there's no difference on Zoom, whether you're sitting here in Egypt or Jordan or, or Palestine or Morocco or the US, it's, it all feels like everybody can work together. So I think it's an opportunity uh, for uh, better collaboration, uh, whether people are working to serve the markets in the Middle East or helping entrepreneurs from the Middle East reach the markets outside. It's, we just have to take this and learn how to use uh, Zoom, Slack, whatever, to create more collaboration uh, between uh, particularly MIT and, uh, and the MIT alums outside, um, outside the US and the Arab world. And please reach out to us if we can help in any way, you know, I think everyone at MIT and every MIT alum is privileged and we, we should help and can help where we can. Yeah. I see big opportunity. So I'm hoping, uh, to, and to your point, policy is very important and we have to work on that at that level as well. Um, but I'm, I'm very hopeful and I think that this shock to the system is a time when we can really see real change happen. Thank you for the opportunity to speak as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you again, the three of you, Marcus, Janan, Dina. This has been a wonderful discussion. Um, and yes, we will follow up with any other questions online. So follow the MIT Arab Alumni Association on LinkedIn or Facebook. Um, thank you to the participants. Thank you to our audience. And we'll see you next week. Thank you all. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.